You can start, Samantha. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today on day four of the um, Southern African HIV Clinician Society virtual conference here at track three. Um, we um, have two distinguished professionals who will be able to give you some more insight into um, a, a climate change and infectious diseases. Uh, we're going to start first with um, Dr. Matthew Chersich. Um, and uh, basically, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, some um, house rules before we can start for the presentations. Um, you're going to get two presentations from uh, Dr. Matthew Chersich and Dr. Ahmed Kordi. Um, we're going to ask you to give your questions in the chat box while the presentations are going on. However, the questions will be addressed after the, both the presentations. Um, and if there is time, uh, we will ask you to um, actually give to to uh, raise your hand and ask the questions instead of us addressing them during the through the chat. Um, and so we're going to get we're going to ask you to also just be on mute. Well, you will be muted um, and then we will take you off uh, mute when it is time for you to actually to give a question. Um, and so without much ado, we're going to get cracking. Um, Professor, actually, Professor Matthew Chosich is a research professor at the University of Advertisement in South Africa and a visiting professor at the University of Ghent in Belgium. His career spans more than 20 years working medical and public health research in Africa with a focus on maternal health and HIV, and more recently on climate change and health. His university training encompasses both clinical and medicine and public health across three high ranking universities and at the colleges of medicine in South Africa and the United Kingdom. More recently, he spent two years as a visiting student at the Institute of Theology at Assisi in Italy. And overall, he's contributed to 14 WHO guidelines or monologues with roles spanning um, guideline writer and reviewer, leads on systematic reviews, leads on methodolo methodologists overseeing um, systematic reviews for guidelines and experts committee. He is a contributing author to the Africa chapter on the sixth intergovernmental panel and climate change report. His work on climate change is centered on assessing the impacts of climate change on maternal health and HIV and consolidating his experience in the disciplines of clinical medicine, biostatistics, epidemiology and public health. And he's presently part of a group of staff and students at the University of the Vastrand who are promoting divestment of fossil fuels. And with that, we're going to hand over to you, Matthew. Excellent. Thank you, um, Sam and others. It's lovely to be back in HIV. Uh, field. I was um, since in the early 2000s. I worked in HIV, but um, in the last four or five years, I've um, switched or moved to climate change and um, health. So let me start by declaring my conflicts of interest. Um, my pension fund is invested in the fossil fuel industry as per policy of the Health Consortium. The University of Witwatersrand holds investments in the fossil fuel industry. It is in my financial interest for the fossil fuel industry to grow and increase its profits. It is in my financial interest to downplay links between the fossil fuel industry and climate change, as making such links will harm my investments and those of my university. So that's where I start and that's where I'll end. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy. And I hope those who think that I'm an um, extremist will bear with me until while we go through some of the science. Um, and then we'll discuss some of the policy. So I thought I'd start with a status update. So what is the world's viral load CD4 count and, and how we're doing in terms of medical care of, of the world? Um, okay, so now I try to break this into kind of qualitative research for social sciences um, around the world. So I'm, I'm starting off by kind of um, giving an update on climate change per se, and then I'll shift to climate change and HIV linkages. So as I said, the kind of starting off with kind of a qualitative um, assessment, more the, the kind of um, the quotes. So I think these are the kind of images or like photos that we're all, all familiar with. Um, and this is how climate change is often presented um, with these natural disasters. Um, and of course, it's linked to wars. And there's a dam that's built, the Grand Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia that's been built. And at the next drought, they're going to close off the flood, the dam wall. And then the countries down below will um, become um, yeah, um, yeah. so that the, the, the dam, the water wars kind of idea, I think, will dominate future um, images. 
And of course, there's the famous Greek wildfire photo with uh, um, the elderly woman whose life had been destroyed. Um, but I think, so that was kind of, that's the kind of adult, um, that's a picture of the adult. We see this old, this older woman who's, who's, um, whose life has changed forever. Um, but I think it's really, it's the child face that is, that needs to be brought to the fore in, um, in, in the qualitative research around climate change. Um, so, yeah, so I put that, I think the children need to be at the forefront because this is the world we're handing over. When my son is um, my age, um, the world will be a better place if, if good people um, don't start to get involved in solving some of these problems. And of course, I've shown you the kind of human face, but the animal face is also, um, uh, is it, and the natural world. This is the world who's, who we're meant to be at least equal with, or who's meant to, um, we meant to be one of the subjects of the, of the natural world. But as you can see from these figures, when we, when humans kind of place ourselves in a su superior position, the corals go, get bleached, we treat animals like elephants, like, um, and of course, in poor ways, and of course, you land up with. Um, what's interesting, you see, um, in the in the um, animals who die of um, um, in drought or um, die of thirst, they, are, they adopt the same position as animals who are, are burnt. So just note, um, you'll see this in, in in many pictures. This classic animal animal burnt drought or thirst death. So the one thing that isn't really focused on, I think. In people's imagination is the we all know these Canadian and Siberian 49 degree heat waves, but the marine heat waves I think is the most critical, um, most critical part of climate change that isn't understood. Then when you get these large marine waves, you've got creatures who are are um, ectotherm or cold. Um, they 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 adapted to cold blooded. They adapted to very narrow range of temperatures at which they can live. Um, and so you have fish, for example, who um, would normally move when water gets warm, they would move down briefly to, a, um, to an area of temperature area where they are comfortable, can live. But um, when, when, the, when the water's, uh, the top layer is extremely hot, they then have to move further and further down. And the further down they move, the less oxygen there is. So the fish is then caught between dying of oxygen or dying of heat. So I think the other qualitative aspect is um, aside from these massive heat waves, is this kind of quieter or slower, slower changes that one sees in the natural world in a qualitative kind of assessment. So on the right, you see that um, it's a picture of where the animals move polewards. Okay, so as the world, world warms, the animals move um, closer to the poles. Um, and then, of course, the question is what happens to animals at the poles? So they then they, they have to continue moving northward. But ultimately, then there's no more space for them. There's a finite amount of distance northward that um, animals that currently live in the poles can move. And of course, on the left, this is a story about how nature's not be uh, the synchronization. So, in other words, when a bird arrives, the worm is about to be be born, and the worm is about to feed on a certain plant, that, and it all is synchronized perfectly over over millennia or over. Um, uh, yeah, uh, from uh, yeah, uh, since ev uh, evolution has made these synchrony beautiful, but as we um, disturb in a rapid way, the synchrony um, is broken, um, and that's a major problem, obviously. So, um, so that's the kind of emotive or um, stories that we like that are important to to um, to understand and to feel inside, um, and and people should feel these things deeply. Um, especially if you consider your children for those you have. So what is the quantitative approach here? So, so this is descriptive analysis. So this should appeal to the modelers or the statisticians in the room. Well, the physics is important. And, and the first person, um, we believe, who, who noted the impact of carbon dioxide in 1896, can you imagine, that he, this um, Svanter, uh, oh nice, no, forgive my pronunciation, he noted the, carbon, the effect of carbon dioxide on... Um, on temperature and how this greenhouse impact. Um, and of course, this became better known and, and the fossil industry, fuel industry became really very, very strongly aware of its impacts about 30 years ago. And humans and many others have kind of denied or downplayed these impacts systematically over since 1896, in fact. So the, the, this is the quantitative assessment. So 
as, he, as, as um, that Nobel laureate noted, that um, carbon dioxide levels with fossil fuel burning will increase. So you'll see this is ice core data going over thousands of years. Um, and you see on the right hand side, since the 1950s, there's this remarkable massive increase. So let's look at that period since 1950 in more detail. You'll see this kind of inexorable rise. Um, and we've now touched the 420 mark. Um, yeah, and you can also see what's important is that the COVID, the COVID sh global shutdown had very little or no impact on the carbon dioxide levels. So in other words, the changes that we need to make as humans are larger than what we saw during the COVID shutdown. And um, we need to know these numbers. Know, like we tell patients, know your CD4, we need to tell each other to know our um, carbon dioxide levels. So if your, um, if your carbon dioxide level rises, so does the temperature. Um, so you'll see this, this, this is a, a kind of a classic figure um, going back to the 1850s where the temperature was monitored and you'll see it remains pretty stable, but it starts to increase around that 1950 mark where you see this massive rise in carbon dioxide. And of course, we're now 1.2 um, degrees centigrade above um, our baseline. And that line is just increasing. And then that magic 1.5 mark is not that far away. At that point, the world starts to kind of unravel. So, so what is the mixed methods? Remember with the qualitative stories, the, so I think some kind of a mixed approach, you can see the polar ice um, goes down um, over time, quite marked, and, and we, we kind of see the, the polar bears and some of that. So this has been described as a code red. Okay, so those who are familiar, the internal, internalist um, amongst us will understand this code red analogy. So it's really an ex, uh, existential threat to most of life on planet. Um, including uh, and especially the life of humankind and the animal world. So this is really a code red from a few weeks ago. So, so let's, let's move on to what is H how do HIV and climate change link? So what are the pathways and what are the impacts that we, um, that we are seeing and that, that will um, uh, worsen as time goes on? So um, I, I break this into four areas. So you have this direct exposure to high temperature. So what happens when it's 49 degrees to someone who's got HIV, okay? It's got particular conditions, particular health problems, et cetera. Then what happens, of course, we know that you get, as temperatures and precipitation changes, you change your risk of infection. Most pathogens are climate sensitive. Okay, this is, a, this is so, so you get these shifts in malaria areas, for example, to, to areas that are non-immune. And of course, higher temperatures makes higher gastrointestinal bacterial infections, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of HIV care in a way yeah um and then the third area is poverty social disruption from drought we spoke about like the food the um, food shortages obviously water wars migration conflict and those are the factors that affect kind of hiv prevention the vulnerabilities that then change one's sexual behavior etc um and, and violence gender-based violence etc and then the fourth area is this damage to health and other infrastructure and storms and wildfires and that disrupts art yeah, we saw it in, in, in those Mozambique floods, it's really difficult to get ART around if you've got um, that, and that has major implications. Um, so yeah, so I'm starting with the direct heat impacts. Okay, so a lot of people, they don't understand that heat is actually a major health hazard. Okay, some people think it's heat, especially those in the Northern Hemisphere. I think when it's, uh, when it's hot, it's time to go to the, to the beach, it's balmy or something. They say, but, but heat is actually a massive uh, health risk, underappreciated, but it is. On the left, you see South Africa. In the 10% of the hottest days in the year, you get this spike in mortality. That's the right-hand side red line, um, largely from respiratory causes. But then you get subtle things. So when it's above 35 degrees centigrade, the chances of being killed in South Africa is 1.2 fold higher than when it's below 20. Um, so there's homicide, suicide, car accidents, everything is really heat sensitive and of course infections and, um, and some other remarkable things I'll come to. So the question is, is the temperature mortality curve in HIV infected people also U-shaped? And if it is, then how steep is the arms on the, on the left-hand side? And that's a question that hasn't been looked at. Um, so the area that I'm working on mostly is um, maternal health and temperature. And and uh, so it's well known there's about 60 or 70 studies throughout the world that shows when it's warmer, you get a, a quite a sharp increase in preterm births, stillbirths, 
um, and a whole range of other conditions. The, the warmer it is, the more um, the more of those kind of adverse conditions you get. So we, when we started to analyze the Joburg data, we were quite surprised because um, Joburg is temperate, um, and we didn't expect kind of stark stark findings. But on the left hand side, you'll see that when the temperature is is higher, the weeks and and during gestation, week seven to ten, you get this massive rise in risk for preeclampsia at childbirth. So you're getting these delayed impacts, um, which is obvious. If you have during weeks seven to ten, you're having if you have difficulties with placental implantation or um, other other factors, your chances of um, preeclampsia we know are much higher. And and in the summer months, uh, I fear that there's a bar. Um, this this um, uh, thing is in the way. In the summer months, the pink bars, you're getting a much longer period of labor, um, up to an hour longer, and the prolonged labor. Um, so next is the the risk of infections with climate sensitive pathogens. Um, and and so here, the, so there are some. There is some evidence that um, um, that the infections are in HIV are climate sensitive. And there was a nice study from 1988 on the right that showed that actually the deaths were also quite seasonal in nature. Um, and often if there's a seasonal pattern, that means that there's either a food or nutrition pattern or an infectious disease pattern. But there's really sharp curves, seasonal curves um, that were seen. So I think this is something that th this point is very, um, uh, we we're talking about weather. And, and the health of people with HIV. So humans that in the natural world is, is season, t uh, season sensitive, yeah? The plants and animals, they, they change every single season. But humans somehow feel that we're not seasonal. We've separated ourselves. We've separated and destroyed, but we, we somehow think we're not seasonal. But Hippocrates noted very carefully, whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should proceed thus. In the first place, consider the seasons of the year. And what effect each of them produces. In this case, we, we, we consider seasons, but also temperature. Also. So we did a review of, of this evidence. Um, and there's unfortunately, there's very few temperature studies. So seasonal studies are pretty crass, to be honest. But um, yeah, we're looking for much clearer, nuanced temperature studies. But there were some quite neat associations. So PCP had kind of a, a quite variety in some settings, the summer it was higher, others winter. Cryptosporidius is quite um, as a, a marked summer season. Um, TB is, I will come to that in the next slide. This is the transmission of TB is really winter. Um, short, um, high, um, pronou more pronounced in winter. And of course there's some um, uh, HIV deaths. We saw some figures, some minor CD4 count changes. Um, and service uptake also is also seasonal um, in nature. So this was quite fascinating. When I first shifted fields, I, I got a chance to write editorials for, for the South African Medical Journal. And the, so the first one I did was on mother to child transmission. Sorry, the first the, the first um, first study, the, the first story that, that I wrote was on mother to child transmission, where I tried to say, um, what are the potential pathways between that might make mother to child transmission increase because of climate change? So I spoke about things like mastitis, because you know when it's hot, you get mastitis, and mastitis is linked to mother to child transmission. We spoke about kind of if you a migrant, you 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 may um, it'll be harder for you to access um, MTCT drugs. Um, if it's a, if you're non-immune and you get malaria, perhaps, perhaps there's some link. Uh, dehydration is uh, means prolonged labor. So I kind of try to draw all these linkages, but it was really speculative and it was my first kind of foray into climate change. But then what was so interesting is recently, um, uh, Carl and Ashraf at, at Rahima Musa, they, they looked at this in a bit more detail, again, in a seasonal approach, which remember needs to be much more nuanced. And here, uh, which we're doing, we have funding, uh, we've just recently received from the NIH to examine this. So yeah, uh, uh, if, if babies were conceived during the warm season, the chances of MTCT was 1.8%. But if you conceived in the cold season, your, your chances is 1%, 1% um, in, in, at the data from Rahima Musa. 
So in other words, being born in, being conceived in the, um, in the cold season is more um, efficacious than single dose levirapine was. Um, and so there's these marked temperature impacts. And the mechanism is, um, it might be that you conceived in winter, but the actual risk that you then have, the mother then has um, childbirth in the summer. And, and, and that's when the, the temperature impacts on transmission. But it's, it's complicated, but there's a seasonal pattern. And if there's a seasonal pattern, we're going to find a temperature pattern. Um, okay, so the interesting is there's climate change might be an opportunity for TB control. In other words, if the temperature is warm, you, you may get um, less transmission in winter. Because remember, like we said, um, TB transmission is high in winter. So if winters become mild, you, you may get less TB transmission. Um, and there's some really elegant studies on this from um, Robin Wood's team and other. And other. Okay, so um, the third part is the damage to health infrastructure. So here, post-disaster, um, there's some very nice examples from Cyclone Ida in, in Mozambique. Um, when the floods came, my house was destroyed, but I managed to reach my plastic bag where I keep my antiretroviral medicines because they're one of my most precious possessions. So yeah, a woman in Malawi um, described her kind of experience. Um, but of course she grabbed a bag of, of medicines, but then she needed to be linked to, to kind of care to receive her next um, set of medicines, um, which is another reason for giving patients maybe six months, six months supplies in case there's a cyclone. Um, but the UNAIDS found some very neat ways of getting around this with um, cyclists, yeah, who, who then di the distributed medicine. But it's really, clearly disasters um, are, are a massive problem. So as, um, as the um, climate change worsens, you're gonna get more of the um, social, the, the poverty implications um, that, that uh, come with, um, with climate change. And here we're talking about and these are many of these agendas uh, as HIV. Um, so the women, the females who are infected with HIV will have much larger impacts, um, especially in the rural areas. So here's one beautiful quote or, or sad quote rather. It's quite sad because we have continuously lost our hard earned produce to erratic climatic conditions. Either the water will be too much and drown everything or the sun comes and burns everything. So these are subsistence farmers who really, um, and they're really, those who are HIV infected are already more vulnerable. Excuse me, I'm trying to turn this thing off. Um, so, you know, when you're stressed out, something like turning one's phone off becomes very difficult. Um, you wouldn't think so, but it's true. <laughs> so, okay. So I've discussed these four ways. Now the next, there's four um, mechanisms here. So the next, the next thing to discuss is what do we do about it from an HIV perspective? Um, and so here we, two, two areas I want to focus on is we need to um, integrate climate change within our HIV research. That's on the left. And then on the right, we need to galvanize our um, coalitions and, and funding um, to address these issues. So the first thing is the HIV community, I think, must engage with the science and with the politics. Our, we've never, our work has never been apolitical. Um, so the HIV scientists, activists, policymakers, we've got decades of experience with building these coalitions to tackle the global health challenges. And so this is a new challenge we need to, that we need to assess. So the first area, I think, is to begin to quantify the impacts of increased temperatures on the health of people living with HIV. Um, the second thing is to integrate climate change within our existing HIV research. So in other words, we need to, to begin to, um, to add these little studies. So this is a neat little study we did um, with Psycho Malik's group. They, 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 had, they do surveys amongst um, school people. So then we, um, we, we um, integrated a simple questionnaire with these school pupils. So this is very concerning. Um, the knowledge really of, of climate change, this is the children's future. Yeah? It's, it's gonna be really marked or shaped by climate change. And yet only 60% knew that it was human activity caused this. Um, only less than two, around two, uh, around three quarters knew that climate change causes temperatures to rise. Can you imagine? 
Um, and 60% believed it affects their health. Only two thirds thought it was serious. Um, um, some half thought the evidence is debated. So it's really, a, the knowledge is a, is a disaster, but the only way in South Africa among secondary school pupils, the only way we found this was by adding this issue to our um, research. The second area, and this is the area that I'm working on quite closely is to um, uh, minimize the temperatures within health facilities. So in poorly constructed health facilities, the temperature is two to four degrees higher indoors than outdoors. Okay, so, but there are a range of low cost um, interventions that we can do to lower temperature um, within these facilities. And I just show a few examples here. So on the left is how the, 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 the clinic is currently. Yeah, if it's 34 degrees outside, it can be 38 inside if it's poorly constructed. Um, which often happens in, in many of the facilities in Africa. But simple interventions like painting the roof white with reflective paint, some trees, um, put a fan, open the windows, um, you'll see major, major changes. Um, provide cool water. And then you're talking about a facility being cooler indoors and outdoors. Um, so in our facilities offer a wonderful platform. The second thing is to develop um, and test climate and health services. So here we would expand the scope of HIV counselors, um, we'd apply the lessons from COVID that we've learned, we'd begin to understand the indicators better, um, so the indicators for climate change. So the HIV community is really good at indicators. Those, those who work in PEPFAR are, um, are by far the, the best um, qualified to understand indicators, okay? And we want to uh, integrate family planning, HIV and environmental services. And of course, we understand cash transfers incredibly well. So post-disaster, who should get that cash transfer? Um, and, and how is that best done? And we understand cash transfers very well. So the next, the next slide, I think, which is really important is that, and this strikes me and it's so sad, that the climate change community are doing the same, exact same mistakes that HIV did in, in 1998 and 2000, the early 2000s. And, and it's, it, it's it's remarkable to, to see how this happens. And they, they, they make these frameworks that, um, that center on things that, are, that, that don't make any sense and that we know um, from HIV are really problematic. So the, 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 uh, the climate change community needs to go through this um, learning curve that we went, these complex issues. Um, and hopefully the, the HIV community could really impact on understanding some of those issues. And, and trying to, to, to accelerate this learning curve. And of course, in HIV, we're amazing with frameworks. So I've been working recently on a framework to understand um, climate change and health, yeah? You have primordial prevention, which is around divestment, activism. It's kind of reducing emissions. Then your primary prevention, which is um, to reduce heat exposure, um, where you change the buildings, you use air conditioning judiciously, personal cooling, you have early warnings, behavior changes, you protect health workers. So you reduce exposure. Then you reduce the sequelae of heat exposure. Um, this is hydration, cooling, mental health, heat stress, stroke, heat stroke protocols. And then of course you've got the long-term harms of heat exposure. So this is tertiary prevention. You've got to monitor and you've got long-term patient care. Um, so, our politics and activists. This is, a, this is one of my favorite photos. I, I showed, I'm sure some of you have seen it. On the right is Dr. Tony Fauci. Um, and on the left in this um, elegant brown suit is um, President uh, Ronald Reagan. And Tony Fauci is explaining the, um, <laughs> the different sequence of um, phases of ART trials. So I think uh, this is a nice example where politicians over decades, we, we've been, been engaged in politics. I mean, sorry, HIV. Um, Scientists have been strongly engaged in, in politics. So we know how to do politics. We know how to tackle um, uh, difficult governments. We know how to tackle international agencies. Um, really, and we know how to engage with our universities. Um, so I'm moving on to an area now that I think um, we're kind of challenged to the group today. And remember, I started off by, by noting that I work in climate change and my job is to understand the impact of fossil fuels on climate change. And, and I'm currently drawing profits from an industry I wish to understand and, and wish to tackle. Um, 
it's a little bit like a lung cancer person being invested in the tobacco industry. Um, so this is today's news. The Mayor de Blasio today announced a 50 billion divestment from fossil fuels and investing that into renewables. The city is committed to net zero emissions in all pension investments. So this is divestment. So what is divestment? Um, so divestment is when you sell your assets, such as stocks and investment funds that are connected to companies involved in extracting fossil fuels. It's not related to research funding. Um, so the university wants to receive Tassel funding or the so that, um, other, other organizations wish to get this money than, than they can. So maybe many of you are wondering why, why, why am I discussing this divestment um, as an example of how how the HIV community can engage. Well, all of us involved, well, not all, but a lot of us are involved in universities um, and others, are, uh, the South African HIV Clinician Society, um, I believe is, hasn't yet divested. Um, we all hold pensions. So this is divestment is really the lever that I think the HIV community in South Africa could first exert. So um, the, the only important thing to note on this slide is that divestment takes so many forms, okay? And people don't understand this. So you can do this, you divest from all companies involved in fossil fuels. You can divest from, only from companies who do coal or, or, or gas, or you can do incentivized divestment from companies that are not meeting emission targets. Okay. Um, and here, yeah, it's the universities will just make an in-principal commitment, and then they implement this over five to 10 years. So universities often fear that, that yeah, we're going to lose our endowment next week um, and we're going to lose most of it. But that's not necessarily true. In fact, there's no immediate loss. We're talking about five to 10 years. And from in five to 10 years, the world will be in a very different place um, as the climate unravels. And, um, and it, with incentivized divestment, potentially you'll never change your portfolio. So every company has its emission targets. And if they meet those, which most will, you don't have to divest. Um, so who has divested? More than half of the UK universities. Harvard recently joined the Bull and Melinda Gates, all of Ireland, and in South Africa, city of Cape Town, the Durban municipality. So this is not a fringe movement. Yeah, this is now mainstream. Um, and so why would we want to encourage our universities to divest? And why am I pushing this so hard for the HIV community in South Africa? So divestment is not about money. So if my university, Wits University, divest, the, the price of Sassel is not going to go down, uh, Sassel shares or Exara or one of these other problematic companies. It's not going to go down. But it will change the public perceptions of the industry and its proponents. Yeah? These companies will lose their social license. It become easier to implement regulations. We can tax their, we can do carbon taxes and we can unblock the barriers to renewable energy. Their renewable energy. Um, so it's really a principle stand where we say, no, 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 I don't want this money. I don't want money that comes from a business of harm. So Sassel is the, Sassel exceeds the, in, the emissions from Sassel exceeds the individual totals of more than 100 countries, um, some together. It's, uh, this is the industry, the money that you get, the money that my university seeks and that we obtain in our pension funds is, is a business of pollution. It's a, and the polluter doesn't pay. Normally, if you have an oil spill, you need to pay for fixing that up. But in this case, the polluter doesn't pay. They, they profit instead. This is the business of lobbyists. Um, the CR17, the Sir Ramaphosa's campaign, he, he, um, he received money from this large um, coal company. And shortly after the election, they got a, uh, shortly after the Nazareth process, they, this company got a, got a large deal. And it, at a, at a, at a, really beneficial rates. Um, and, and we've seen that the lobbyists have major influence in the US and among the Republicans and the Democrats. And there's a large suspicion that the Democrats um, in the US will not be as active as they've said. They had um, um, promised to be in election, but yet they, they, um, they, they have these intense lobbyists who um, will undermine their program, their, their progressive nature that they've promised. It's a business of crime. Um, and you'll see these, the, the, um, the coal industry in South Africa is incredibly profitable, but it, it's largely because they, they charge Eskom what they want. Um, and they do these crazy, these absurd deals where Glencore was paid double the, um, double the price of other 
other supplies for the same quality coal. Um, and, and, and you'll get these, we all know the, um, the, this corruption is endemic in this country, but the, within the fossil fuel industry, Eskom is really uh, marked. So this is a business of, that suppresses competition. Um, this power ship deal, the um, Sassel gets um, subsidies. So how can a wind farm compete with a firm that, that gets um, massive subsidies? Um, so if this business is harmful, denial is collusive, at times criminal and dishonest, is it ethical for my university and for me and for the clinician society to seek their profits and for your universities? And, and so in, 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 so this is the key, the key question here is, in the absence of ethical and credible leadership in South Africa, we bear great responsibility. And you've seen this in the COVID pandemic, there, there's this absence, this, this vacuum of leadership in the country um, in, from politics and from, from, from the, the areas politicians and the areas that one would expect leadership, there's this vacuum. And so people like um, Shabir Mahdi, Helen Rees, Fenta, and um, the, 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 um, Jeremy Null, and, and many others had to stand in, step in, to take this, to bear this responsibility. And divestment will catalyze, in the same way, will catalyze these debates around climate change. If we come out and we say, no, no, um, we cannot um, invest in fossil fuels, and, and we need to shift to renewables. That will have a, a large impact. Um, so I guess I want to give you one example of UCT. So they began a journey in 2013 to discuss divestment. And this journey will finish in 20, uh, uh, this year, 2021. Um, a fascinating journey. So in the end, so what happened initially for many years, they, they did committee side. Yeah. So universities are very smart and, and governments. What all you need to do is to make a committee. Yeah. So you, you, you make a committee who's tasked with deciding something and you can delay and you can obfuscate and, and you can ask for preliminary reports and you can do multiple committee side, yeah, ways of killing things. So, so the UCT did that for many years, um, but eventually they came out with a report in August. This was the university's um, um, committee on responsible in, um, investment set up by the vice chancellor, et cetera, on their recommendations. Um, to the University Council. And the University Council will vote on this um, in December. And it seems that they have very broad support. So having applied its mind to this matter, this um, Committee on Responsible Investment uh, puts forward the following recommendations to the trustees of the foundation, the University Council. And they say, the UCT Foundation and the Council, their recommendation is that the UCT Foundation, which is the endowment, and the Council commit themselves to fully divesting their assets um, from fossil fuels by 2029 or early if possible. So UCT has chosen the fully model, um, which is really very impressive. It's the most comprehensive model. Um, and they've given themselves uh, eight, nine years to, to do so. They certainly won't lose any money for the next um, five or six years. So, um, so this, is a, uh, this is the final slide on the kind of rationale for why why we want divestment. So divestment started in apartheid and it was, um, uh, no one cared about the stock price of these companies. And step by step, the divestment movement changed the public discourse and it transformed the decisions of corporations to get out of South Africa, out of our government. And the government at that time was led by the Republicans and they passed a sanctions bill. So by analogy, if we are able to, in UCT and our universities are able to, um, to encourage and to facilitate divestment, you change the public discourse and you, you change the decisions of companies like Standard Bank and others who still in, enjoy the pleasures of um, fossil fuel money through funding coal plants. Um, and of course, you, you get sanctions or coal taxes passed. So just before I, I, I close, I'd like to just update everyone on the status at Wits University. And remember that Wits is a mining university. Yeah? It started off with the South African School of Mines in Kimberley. Um, and it has remained a really strong mining university. That those who are familiar with WITS know there's this Amic deck um, that links East and West Campus. It was recently uh, renamed after the, um, the Lonman, um, remember Lonman was linked to the Marikana, um, and they had then renamed themselves and as part of kind of, um, as part of redoing the image, they, they paid, for, or, or maybe for, out of kindness, they paid for renaming of the Amic deck. Um, and, and of course, Sassel sponsors um, probably hundreds of students' bursaries at WITS. 
and it remains really a very strong mining university. And that's something to be proud of. We've done amazing research on mining, but it's um, that then you do have this massive lobby in the campus. So, so it's a mining university. So it's not like UCT in, in that respect. But so at WITS, remember UCT started 2013, at WITS in 2021, and there's really, um, that's when we're starting, unfortunately. So the, the university said in July that they would form a committee and it's now November, there's no sign of this committee. So UCT will divest in December, WITS will still be discussing the potential of forming a committee. Um, and the, the other key issue is that the university declines to give us or people in this divestment movement a chance to present our position. So we are, have a mainstream position that we wish to meet our executive at our university. And we have four council members who are on board. The chair of the council has signed this, this thing and many of the senior um, council, the four, three other council members and about 50 research professors have taken a clear position on this. So all we asked was for half an hour with the senior executive at WITS and this has still been declined. Um, and committee side hasn't begun yet. So, um, and I know that many people at WITS are listening. So within our HIV community, we protect our patients. We incorporate, our H we incorporate climate change into our research, um, uh, particularly around heat. And we think of novel ways to secure ART and we fight. Our work is not, is not apolitical. We tackle divestment like we tackled COVID um, as a community. And we can solve this problem. Um, and I, I think the first place to start is with divestment. So I'd like to acknowledge all my coworkers. Um, this list is not um, uh, uh, complete, but there's a large group of us, and we're beginning something really nice. It's um, got four large projects, a massive NIH grant we just um, received. Um, our group, in fact, is four out of four of our last grant applications. Um, and even by the standards of um, HIV, where we have quite a large success rate, four out of four is, 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 is something to be largely proud of. And there's two more that we'll be quite confident. So we, I think we'll have six out of six of our last grant applications, um, more than 100 million raised, uh, grants with 400 odd million. So I'm not saying that because I wish to, to boast. And I'm not saying that because I'm smart. In fact, many would argue I'm not smart. Um, and they're probably right. I'm, I'm saying that because this is a new field with a lot of money coming for good reasons. So um, there's a lot of interest and funding coming in this field. Um, and, and these grants are easy, you know, don't tell anyone, but they're easy to win. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunities for us um, as a community to engage. Excellent, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, your passion definitely shines through. Um, and the presentation has actually given, I think, lots of, um, you know, lots of thinking points and I, I guess talking points afterwards. Um, so now we're going to move to Dr. Um, Cordy's presentation. Um, and he's going to talk to us about, you've heard about HIV, now you're going to hear about hepatitis and climate change. Um, Dr. Ahmed Cordy is a consultant physician and a research fellow at the Department of Endemic Medicine at Cairo University Hospital and the founder of the Casal Aini HIV and Viral Hepatitis Fighting Group and coordinator of the Supreme Council of University Hospitals Committee for the Medical Virology and Bloodborne Pathogens. He's also the immediate past chief of the HCV HIV co-infection program at the National Committee for Combating HIV Viral Hepatitis. His areas of expertise include viral hepatitis and HIV viral hepatitis co-infection. Um, and he's um, actually, I'm not sure now what happened to my screen. Oh, here we go. And um, he has been implement involved in the implementation of the first collaboration protocol between Cairo University hospitals and fever hospitals in Cairo in 2015. He um, used this, this opportunity to gain the um, attention of healthcare workers and create more interest in, um, uh, in hospitals of, uh, in working with people to, uh, with HIV. Um, and he's launched the first specialty clinic that was designed to serve and treat co-infections like and comorbidities like dys dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease and bone disorders. So um, Dr. Corey, you can take it away. Thank you, Dr. Samantha, for the very kind uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to present today about the viral hepatitis and climate changes. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to thank all of my uh, 
uh, team members in Qasr al-Aini, HIV and viral hepatitis fighting group, because without their efforts and help, uh, nothing of this presentation have been accomplished. Uh, here is my disclosures, nothing to disclose related to the presentation topic. Uh, to go for an introduction, I think that uh, Professor Massimo made it very easy for me now uh, to talk directly about the effect of climate changes and viral hepatitis, but we need uh, to highlight that the world nowadays are uh, is facing uh, a lot of emerging uh, viruses and infectious diseases like HIV AIDS, hantaviruses, viral hepatitis, and SARS-CoV-1 firstly, followed by SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 nowadays. And I think this is reflecting a combined impact of the rapid demographic, environmental, social, technological, and other changes in the ways of living. And maybe we can consider that the climate changes can come on the top of this uh, changes that may affect the occurrence of infectious diseases. Uh, here in this slide, you can see, uh, according to the WHO, that we have five major health impacts of the climate change, uh, buffing through the malnutrition, deaths and injuries caused by storms and floods, the affection of the water uh, quantity and the quality, also the heat waves that may have a direct or indirect effect on morbidity and mortality related to diseases, and also the vector-borne diseases like malaria and dengue fever. And I think at least three of these major impacts can be related to the viral hepatitis. Uh, also, uh, this relation, we can, we can say that it is a very old relation even before the discovery of the role of the infectious agents uh, on the development of the diseases. Uh, for example, late in 19th century, the Romans were retreated to hell resorts each summer to avoid malaria. And also the South Asians learned early that in high summer, strongly curried foods were less likely to cause diarrhea. In this graph also we can see uh, a very strong correlation between temperature and number of reported cases of salmonellosis in England, but it is not only about salmonellosis, but we have a lot of uh, what we call climate sensitive uh, diseases like heat stress, effect of storms, air pollution effect, asthma, vector borne diseases, water borne diseases, food borne diseases, and sexual transmitted diseases. And I think the last four ones can cover all of the hepatotropic and non-hepatotropic viral hepatitis and also HIV AIDS. Also, as Dr. Matthew stated, that uh, even the vulnerable population group who are affected by the uh, climate changes problems, also the same vulnerable population that may be affected by viral hepatitis and HIV AIDS, like the people with chronic medical conditions, the people facing social isolation, poor and vulnerable communities, the very young children and elderly people and women. So uh, from this point, we can go more deep in the relation of the infectious diseases and the climate changes. We need to state that uh, viruses in their living environment are facing a lot of uh, climatic factors, but the temperature variations and the carbon dioxide rates are the most important factor that may affect the uh, virus uh, mutations. And as a result of this climate changes, uh, and I think the most important one is the sudden temperature and changes may give an ideal breeding ground to develop new modifications and new mutations and emergence of new infectious diseases. And also the WHO was always warning about the risk of the climate changes in conjunction with the globalization, demographic and social changes that may make a major influence in the occurrence of, of infectious diseases. Also, the scientists have a clear demonstration of uh, the relation between the, the extent of the rise in world's temperature and the increase in the average activity of malaria transmitting mosquito. And this is a very good example on the effect of the climate changes on the spread of uh, the infections, and especially that may affect the uh, liver uh, like malaria. Also, we uh, have uh, the relation of the um, environmental factors related to climate changes like the pollution. And I think we have solid evidence that SARS-CoV-1 uh, epidemic was causing a more severe disease in the cities that was facing high level from air pollution. And I think we also have uh, an emerging uh, and rising evidence about the same thing for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Uh, 
So when we have a more uh, polluted environment, so we are subjected to have a more severe disease. Also, we cannot neglect the role of insects, animals, and humans in spreading viruses under the effect of these climatic changes. Uh, and other, one of the interesting pieces of literature stating that 30% of all emerging diseases from the previous decade was transmitted by vectors. And we were, were giving example of the spread of Lyme disease in North Canada, which has experienced more than 200% uh, increase uh, due to changes in the temperature and rise of temperature. Also, uh, we can say that the destruction of pristine ecosystems, raising of forests and the other impact of the humans on the environment may increase the risk of the transfer of infections from the animals to people, what we call zoonotic diseases. And actually it's reported then nearly 75% of all new diseases emerging or re-emerging to affect the humans are coming on zoonotic background. And the CDC is providing the uh, COVID-19 example as a leading example for this situation. In this table, you can see a lot of examples on how the diverse environmental changes may affect the occurrence of various infectious diseases. But I think uh, my objective is to go more with the uh, viral hepatitis and especially the hepatotropic viruses. As you can see here, uh, we can say that for hepatitis A, there is a, a well-defined interaction between the behavior of the rotavirus and the hepatitis A genes and the climatic changes, and especially under the pressure of the carbon uh, uh, dioxide and temperature changes, this, this increase the, the mutation ratio in the viral RNA and may cause a change in uh, the uh, severity and uh, the disease caused by this viruses. The other virus that directly may be affected by the climate changes is the hepatitis E virus. And actually we need to state that the enterically transmitted hepatitis now is a major health problem facing a lot of countries in Africa in the tropical and subtropical region. And we can say that the climate changes can directly affect the hepatitis E propagation due to the affection of the water cycle, uh, because the affection of the quantity and the quality of water resources, for example, by the seasonal flooding, this may cause contamination of the water supplies by the human sewage. And I call, uh, this may cause thousands of hepatitis E infections. But it is not the case for hepatitis B and C. We don't have a very clear relation between the climatic changes and the viruses themselves. But we can see here that uh, patients with HCV-related liver disease may suffer from fatigue, especially in hot weather. And also we have good evidence that people who have uh, HCV-related chronic liver disease had significant elevation in ALT and reduction in serum albumin and significant increase in the viral load in the hot weather when it's compared to winter. So we are always uh, advising our patients uh, to avoid excessive environmental or occupational heat to avoid this uh, significant changes that may affect the health of their liver under the effect of Hep C or hepatitis B. So I'm coming to uh, my conclusion that the viral hepatitis is uh, a rising health problem and gaining a lot of uh, 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 attention of the world, also the same for the climatic changes. And I think we always, we have to keep in mind this uh, issue that even a healthy liver may be affected by heat stroke resulting in the elevation of liver enzymes, massive cell necrosis, and even acute cell failure. So we need to think too much about the uh, liver, about the viral hepatitis, about the HIV AIDS, while we are uh, thinking about the impacts of climatic changes in human health. I think I have came to the end of my presentation and I'm very happy to hear any questions. Yeah, um, if, by raise of hand, if, if people could indicate if they have any questions, please, then we can unmute you. Okay, so... Um, while people are thinking about the questions, I think um, I'd like to say thank you both to you, Ahmed and, and Matthew, your your presentations. Um, you know, they explain the science around it. I think they explain the common sense around it. Um, and, and I think people understand that. But, um, you know, in the last few days, the people around me, when I spoke about climate change and, you know, um, infectious diseases, 
it was like how they linked. And I, I think um, maybe my question is a little bit simpler. It's a simple question, but maybe harder to implement. How do we improve the education around this link, um, possibly to younger people, um, so that they, they start thinking about this and making that difference that they need to make when they are our age, so that they can have a better life? Ahmed? Go ahead, you Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, Sam, the, like the, the, the national curriculum um, for schools has two lines on, um, on climate change um, out of a very thick book. Um, but of course, we know the education department is um, struggling to function in South Africa. Um, but also interesting, in medical school, there's also very few lines in the, um, in the curriculum when in teaching around climate change. Even in the Masters of Public Health, or it's... Um, it's quite poorly developed, um, but also varies by university. Uh, so Stellenbosch has made what's called a school of climate change, the whole school, so, and at the equivalent of a faculty. So it's really like the faculty of climate change, can you imagine? Um, and at that university, they're then mainstreaming climate change into all courses. In fact, like there's a call that you need to have climate change in every single um, course at university. You must have at least some component because climate change affects every component of life. And if it does, then it should really be in every curricula. Um, so yeah, so that is a good, that's a good question. Um, but it's kind of mainstream. I think it's also catching up. So the world, um, I had a nice graph, which I took out, unfortunately. The world, um, the, the climate has changed. Yeah, but the temperature is now 1.2, it's going to 1.5. The world is going to end 2060. But the humans have not caught up yet. We, we're a bit slow, yeah? As clever as we think we are, we haven't yet begun to understand the, what this means and certainly not how to act um, and, and not to teach our children. So we're just learning, but the question is, are we going to learn fast enough? <laughs> yeah, I'm totally agree to you, uh, Matthew, about the need to uh, update the uh, medical curriculum with the, the uh, data about the climate changes and its effect on the uh, different diseases but i think also uh, we need uh, to catch up with the people who are not uh, now revising the medical curricula so i think we, we need uh, some tailored messages to be delivered to the especially the leaders of the uh, societies and uh, different uh, uh, bodies working in the field of infectious diseases and viral hepatitis and, and hiv aids uh, to uh, raise their awareness about this issue and they can spread the, the word to uh, people who are working with them in their teams okay see so people are there's still no questions so i'll ask another question um, in, in terms of, um, you know, Matthew, you spoke about um, funding being a little bit easier to, to get when it comes to climate change. And obviously, you both spoke about different diseases, but the end point is the same, right? Climate change has an impact on health, and whether it's treatment adherence for HIV or hepatitis or anything, the point is that it's treatment adherence that's been affected. So um, as this is kind of emerging, um, I think, for somebody who's not in climate change, um, is there a move or should there be a move to for the development of, of more consortia that are related not for a particular disease in climate change, but looking at addressing health and climate change and how we move that forward um, globally and in different sectors? I'm going to just start this time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you can uh, repeat your question, Ed, the, the voice was not very clear for me. Oh, no, I'm asking about, um, is, is there a move or should there be a move when we're considering funding for applications to be more collaborative and that people work together in terms of climate, mm -hmm. in, you know, in setting up consortia for funding climate change for health and addressing climate change for health I, as opposed to addressing I climate think, change yeah. for particular health areas? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, I think we have to uh, to to do this and have uh, uh, what we call uh, advo ad advocative work for uh, having fund for uh, the climatic changes affection, and I think uh, and my advice from uh, uh, our experience on work and working in such work uh, to go out of the uh, 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 what we call. Um, uh, official organizational work, but we can do, uh, if you have stated, like a consortium or uh, a work, uh, a working framework to uh, seek for funding and to raise awareness and to raise the um, uh, more research questions about the effect of the climate changes, because we need more evidence. While I was preparing my presentation, I was not finding a lot of evidence to, sh to share with you about the uh, uh, theoretical effect that I know about the climatic changes and the different diseases. So I think we need uh, to go for this for sure. Yeah. So um, Sam, another point is that um, so much of it is multidisciplinary. So I like your question around consortium. Um, yeah. So we land up with uh, <laughs> about ten disciplines, which had its own its own kind of challenges. Um, you've got the climate scientists who understand modeling but um, they they don't really work on health um, and then you have pure modelers and you have the health group um, infectious diseases some social behavioral scientists um, health economics is important so they, all these kind of and we form these complex consortium um, because it is a complicated um, question and statisticians obviously um, and clinicians because they've got the, the health outcome data um, so I think there's a part of the problem is that I don't think people are organized yet um, to, to there isn't like a, um, a proper way a mechanism for bringing these people together and so you you at, at, at UCT for example they made this thing called ACDI um, where they brought all the groups together um, and I think Stellenbosch's idea of, of having a whole school so anyone working in climate change is now part of this the school is like a formal mechanism because uh, people are kind of stuck. So I was lucky to switch out of HIV, but a lot of people, when I've asked, say, you know, why are you still working on HIV when you're trying to understand a very minor shift? People are studying oral prep. They're looking at really like a sliver of additional information around uh, adherence in 12 to 13 year olds um, who have diabetes. I'm exaggerating, but like in HIV, the research questions are, are becoming thinner. Um, whereas in climate change, there's just these, un, these massive research questions that have, we haven't even begun to grapple with on an issue that's important. But people are still scared to switch. Um, and rightly so. You, you've been passionate and worked hard on a topic for uh, two decades or more. Um, and there's, you know, and, and you're, you can switch to COVID. A lot of people have switched to, like, COVID research. But to, to switch to climate change research, I think they... That kind of thinking hasn't yet um, become part of the HIV field yet. And so then you can't form this consortium because people aren't, they don't know the questions, they're busy. So until we kind of get a larger group of, of interested parties, it's very difficult. I just think that you probably don't have that amount of time to, mm. to, to get those groups together. Um, I still am not seeing any questions in the box and there's nobody raising their hands from what I can see. Um, can I, we still have some time? Yeah, I wonder if it's worth, worth asking those who attended if they, what they, their, um, their interests are. You know, are they, um, would they be interested in engaging research? Do they find the kind of HIV activism that I discussed um, something that resonates with their um, the history of, of HIV activism. I don't know. It's, I'm interested because I always have my fixed ideas, but I, um, you know, I think to hear what other people are thinking about climate change. You know, do you cry when you think about your children? Yeah, they they they're done for, um, or your grandchildren certainly. I don't know what. How do people think? Yeah. Sam, you have nightmares or not? Well, I have nightmares about lots of sure. things here. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, 
I was saying that, sure, we have nightmares about the climatic changes and its effect on our health and the uh, diseases that we are facing nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question from someone about sharing slides, and I'm very, very happy to do that. Um, I don't know how, how we do that. What I can do is maybe share a link um, to the slide set that I just um, sent and then people could download it. That might be useful, no? Um, I think for, for immediate, you could do that while the Secretariat um, collates all the presentations and the recordings and makes it avail available for the entire conference. But for Excellent. people that are here, I'm, I'm sure if, if that's allowed, you, you are welcome to do that. Um, I, I, you know, I know you were limited in what you could cover in your presentations, but if, uh, yeah, there we go, the SACs will share the post with the conference. Um, so if, I don't know if at this point is there anything else that was not in, the, in your presentations that you'd like to raise. I'm sure you guys mm. You know, we could have carried on for um, for, for for much longer. <laughs> I cut quite a lot of slides, as, um, you know, but uh, but I think we've covered kind of the main the main thrust, and uh, that framework I think is important. Um, yeah, but I think and and the, the the thing that strikes me most is that as they kind of build this response. Um, to climate change and health. You know, the world, in, in Paris, they promised $100 billion a year to the high-income countries who've caused climate change, promised $100 billion a year to solve um, or to address the climate change crisis in um, low-middle-income countries. Um, so that, prom that promise has never even been close to being um, uh, met or uh, um, actualized. Um, and so there's there's actually not that much funding for these large scale projects that are needed. You know, you can't have a woman delivering in a facility in labor for 10 hours um, when it's 47 degrees um, and it's 42 outside outside the facility. You know, that's that's not going to end well, um, and it doesn't end 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 well. So um, so that's that's kind of is for me those those kind of lessons and implementation lessons and even the money that is there. What I said is that the the way that it's spent or the thinking around it is really um, I don't know maybe primitive for a better word that have these long endless forms that countries have to fill in, um, which is what the Global Fund for H HIV TB and Malaria did initially. These are thick forms, and and countries cannot fill those; they don't have the capacity to to complete um, this, these crazy forms. Um, and the implementation is the the saddest part is the, the the focus they want to make is on strengthening health systems, which is also what HIV did um, initially, I think. Rather than in, in the end, PEPFAR and these other people came like parallel, and you strengthen by being parallel, um, by being vertical, you strengthen horizontal, and these debates are just not happening. And and they're only focused on we must strengthen HIV, no, sorry, health systems without any clear understanding of what that means and. And knowing that the world has been trying to strengthen health systems since Alma Ata, since um, maybe since health facilities began, and we, we haven't done that. We, we struggle to do that without this kind of horizontal, vertical, diagonal approach. But sadly, the climate change community doesn't want to listen. So, I mean, as a beginning, I think we know that there really, really is still a lot to achieve. Um, even if you look at HIV, which has progressed so much, we still have a lot to achieve. So, yeah, yeah. good luck to the climate change <laughs> scientists. Um, Excellent. We still not getting anything from the um, the panelists. Um, Matthew, if you've got nothing, Ahmed, do you have anything? <laughs> uh, I think I'm done now. Uh done now. Um, maybe it's just too early in a Saturday morning um, for people to want to contribute anymore. I'd like to say thank you to the people who joined us today. Thank you to the um, tech staff at SACS and um, there's a link that's come up there for everybody who wants to just copy that quickly and um, you know so you can access Matthew's presentation. 
Um, thank you to Ahmed and Matthew for your very you. um, thought provoking um, presentations. And we hope you really did, you know, start getting people thinking about it and start um, changing those thoughts into action. Um, and if there's nothing else, then I'd actually like to close the session and uh, hope to see everybody else for the rest of the, the day. So thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, everyone. Are we good?